Okay, so, um, so this morning um, we're going on to a new stage of our series, Replicate. Um, we've already talked about several stages. We've talked about how as a church, all that we do as a people of God is to bring glory and praise to our Father. Um, that's the foundation of who we are as people, as living beings. Um, we all have the urge to praise and bring glory to his name. And we talked about how uh, when churches are planted, the early stages of growth, first, the soil has to be repaired. There needs to be spiritual foundations laid, right? And we talked about the gospel seed being planted and how when it's nurtured, it grows and it develops deep roots into the hearts and lives of the people that it reaches. Um, and those roots, they don't, just, they don't just stay within the people as they grow also into the community. As a church, we should be plugged in and connected into our neighborhood. We talked about how hopefully the areas where we live and dwell as Christians, people know that we're Christians. People know that there's a church present among them. Um, we talked about how as we become engaged in our neighborhoods and our communities, and we begin to grow strong as a body of believers. We begin to grow strong branches. We talked about developing leaders um, and how as each of us as Christians have all been empowered and equipped in different ways. God's made each one of us separate. And we talked about the importance of developing those gifts as apostles, prophets, shepherds, teachers, and evangelists. Um, and then the last few weeks, we talked about producing fruit. How as Christians, we naturally should be producing other disciples, what it means to be disciples that make disciples. And we also talked a little bit about how we should see other fruit flourish as well. There should be the products of goodness, love, joy, peace, patience coming out of our family of faith. Um, and today we'll be talking about living an organic life together as the church and what it means to be the mature body of believers. Um, so before we, before we get into that, I want to review just a little bit from last week. We've been talking about um, us as a family of God. We're a living community, right? The church is a living being. So last week, we, the, the final verse we looked at was from John 15, verse 8. As he said, my father is glorified in this. We've talked about the importance of bringing praise and glory to his name. And he said, my father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit and that you prove to be my disciples. So it's a very core of our being as disciples to be disciple makers. Um, and as we do so, it brings glory and praise to God. This is who we are as the church. So I have a little video that I want to share um, that talks about, it's a, it's a little video, it's a cartoon, but it's an illustration of who we are as the church and how really as the church, as we let go and let God through his spirit take control, the church naturally does all these things we've looked at, um, but sometimes we try and control it on our own. Um, so here's a little illustration using um, farming um, as an example. So we'll watch a little cartoon and I'll, I'll explain some afterwards. So, so here's the story of the big red tractor. Big tractor. The big red tractor and the little village. Once upon a time in a little field in a happy little village, lived a big red tractor. Every morning during plowing season, the village people, no, not those village people, would come out and start the red tractor. Everyone loved the tractor and the powerful noises it would make. They would cheer for the big red tractor because he would help them through plowing season. The people worked together to move the tractor. Half of the villagers would push from behind while the other half would pull. They had been doing it this way for many generations. Some days they moved the tractor 10 feet. Some days they moved it 20. They did this for three whole months every year. Because of their hard work, the villagers always managed to plow the field just in time to plant and just before the rainy season. The rains would come to water the field. Then the sun would come out to make the crops grow and then the people would come out and harvest all the new crops. It was just enough food to feed the entire village. One day, Farmer Dave was cleaning out his attic. To his surprise, he found an old book tucked beneath his great-grandpa's belongings. It was the owner's manual to the big red tractor. This book told about how the tractor was made and all of the great things it could do. Farmer Dave studied the book all night. 
He was shocked by what he was reading. According to the book, if the big red tractor was running properly, it could plow the whole field in just one day. Early the next morning, Farmer Dave gathered the villagers to tell them the good news. But nobody believed him. There's no way that tractor can move on its own, some said. One lady said, it sounds like you're reading a fairy tale. The people laughed at him. This made Farmer Dave very sad. This didn't stop Farmer Dave from believing what he read. Every night, while the other villagers were asleep, Farmer Dave spent time repairing the big red tractor. One night, Farmer Dave fixed the tractor completely. He jumped on the tractor and had so much fun driving it, he ended up plowing the whole field in one night. The next morning, the villagers woke up and were in shock. The whole field had been plowed. It's a miracle, one man said. Maybe aliens came down, said an old woman. No, look over there, a little boy shouted. It was Farmer Dave sleeping on the tractor. It was then that the people shouted, He was right, the tractor book is true. The villagers ended up plowing many fields that year and harvesting way more food than they could ever eat. They had so many leftover boxes of food that they began taking the boxes to other villages where food was scarce. The big red tractor and his little village soon became famous throughout the land. They became known as the most generous and life-giving people in the whole wide world. Okay, so um, this, is a, this is a little kid's book that a church leader um, wrote to explain to his kids about what the church um, should look like. So in this story, uh, what, is rep what represents the church in the story of the Big Red Tractor? What was the church? The village, yeah, the village is kind of the church and it's because it's the gathering of the people, right? Um, so there's the villagers, but what else is the church? The tractor is the church, right? Um, so here's this farmer um, in, in Thailand. In Thailand, most of the times you don't use tractors. Um, but in America, we, we plow our fields with tractors. Um, we think of tractor farming. I'm not sure how it is in New Zealand. I know you've got some sheep, right? <laughs> um, but in America, we have tractors like this. Um, but they're big things. I don't know if you've seen a tractor. They're a big thing, right? Um, and how did the village initially farm with the tractor? What did they do? They pushed it, right? Um, has anyone ever pushed a car? In Thailand, like when you go to Big C, you want to park your car. I don't know if you drive. You have to like push the cars a little bit. And it can be hard at first, right? You push one of these dinky little things, these little Nissans like what Sam's got. It's not that hard, right? You can push and get it going. You go to push a big tractor, that's hard. <laughs> um, you think of plowing a field, pushing a tractor, really it sounds kind of ridiculous, right? Um, but the point that Francis Chan, the author, is trying to make is that sometimes we do the same thing with the church um, by trying to get the church um, and controlling it on our own. He says, it's as just as silly as us getting out with a big tractor and trying to push it and by trying to get it to move by our own power. Because who's the one, who's the one that leads the church? It's God, right? Um, who's the one empowering the church? It's God through his spirit, right? So he talks about Farmer Dan, he goes away and he finds the tractor manual. What does a tractor manual, do you think, represent? The Bible, <laughs> right? And just like oftentimes as Christians, we don't read this book a lot of times, right? You know, and then when we open up, we're amazed like Farmer Dan with that tractor manual. He opens it up and he says, what in the world? <laughs> he says, if this, he says, according to this, he says, that tractor can plow the field in one day says we're not doing what this book here says sometimes sometimes when we're not living out our lives as disciples as we ought to be or living our lives out as the church as we've been called to be man this can seem like alien words right i'm gonna be like what is what is happening here um doesn't represent what i've been seeing around us unfortunately sometimes that can be the case right um so he says man if we're doing what this says we should be having much different results. And that's true for us as a church as well. As we live according to God's word, man, God's going to be driving that tractor, right? 
um, and the results are going to be powerful. Um, and the, village, the villagers, as they began to work um, and allow the tractor to run the way that it should be running, um, they not only had enough food for themselves, uh, but to bless those around them, right? And we believe that this is true for us as the church, as we're allowing God to work through us and among us, as we should be. Um, not only are we going to be just getting by, because that's what they were doing on their own might, right? They had to work so, so hard, and they're like, oh, now we have just enough food to get us through, basically, right? But as God takes hold of the church, not only are we nourished, but those around us are blessed as well. Um, so today, uh, we don't have a lot of time, but I want to look at a few principles. I want to look at several things from the book of Acts. Um, so if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 2. As, um, as we look at this stage, I called it organic life in the mature body because our, as a group, as a family, we're a living community. Um, and talking about the church, there's tons of things we could talk about. We're not going to talk about every aspect as to what it means to be the church, um, but we're going to talk about several core things as to what the church does. Um, today we're going to be looking at community in general. So in Acts chapter 2, this is after Peter delivers that first gospel message, the first time that those seeds have been sown and believers were baptized. As he talks about this group, this church that was formed, he says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and of prayers. He says that this community, this group, they became devoted to these four things, to the teaching, to fellowship, breaking of bread, and a prayer. And we're going to see that these things, um, that they carry them on throughout this book. Um, the, this book is called Acts in English. Um, it's, it's gone through several other names. Um, some people will call it um, Acts of the Apostles. Um, and Acts is just an abbreviation of basically the word action, right? Some might say it's the book of actions of the apostles, or, or really it's actions of the whole church. Or some might even say, as you, say, as you look at the book and say, who's the star of the story? Some would say it's not, it's not really the church because we're not the star, right? They say it's the Holy Spirit because it's in the book of Acts that we finally see that spirit of God that Jesus promised come. And he's taking control. He's the one doing all of the work. He's the one that's acting out among these people. So we see Jesus, Jesus empowering his people through the Holy Spirit in this book. As the church flourishes, as what we see in this book of Acts. And these people, these set-apart believers, they become a community together. And that's what, we wanna, that's what I want to look at today, is this community that's formed together as the church. So um, when we talk about community, um, I think that community can mean um, a lot of things. As we talk about church, a lot of things might come to our head, right? Some of you are new, um, some of you are new to our classroom, but we've talked about how, how the scripture, and we don't believe that us as the church means the building, right? Um, we believe that we're free to worship God at any place, any time, right? It's not about buildings, uh, because we're the church, right? Um, and that he's opened us up to have a relationship, connection with him. We all have that freedom and access to him. So what, is, what does community mean? When you think of community, what, is a, what does it mean to be a community, would you say? What just comes to your mind? So we're all on the same page first. Okay, yeah, a group of people. What's community? Huh? Different nationalities. Okay, think of like different different people groups, maybe. Okay. Okay, like people people working together. Okay, yeah. Yeah, if you're not working together, you're not community. Where where I grew up, where I lived, I had a lot of neighbors. I lived in a neighborhood. We lived in an area where most people lived on farms. Um, out in the desert. They don't have any neighbors. But I lived in a the neighborhood. There are a lot of houses, okay? But every morning, my family, we left at 5.30 a.m. <laughs> and then my, most of my neighbors did the same thing from about 5 to 7. Everyone's leaving. And then we all get back at about 10 p.m. I never saw those people. Are we community? We are close to each other physically, right? But is that community? 
Why not? Yeah, there's no relationship, right? What are you saying? Ah, I like that. You're in a community. <laughs> yeah, you're in the space, but you're not communing, right? Communion means this sharing, this fellowship together, right? Um, I don't have my marker, but we've talked about before how as a church, we engage in Christian community on three different levels. We've talked about before, right? There is that big level, the large church group like we are here today, and we've talked about how there's a middle level of our missional community, um, our small group community size, where maybe that's where you worship with your family, I'm at your building or at your office space, um, that group of about 10 to 20 people, you're on a mission community together. And then we also have that smaller group of about two or three or four, um, where you're able to really um, form close bonds together. We saw that even Jesus had relationships like this with Peter, James, and John, right? And on the mission level with the 12 apostles. Um, so it takes time in sharing life together, right? Um, and this morning, I want to talk about another kind of word that is used today in talking about um, people groups and talking that's used in sociology. And that's this word, communitas. And this word is used um, to explain community in a different way um, because it talks about the special kind of relationships formed together as a community. Um, so communitas, um, one person, he explains it this way says, communitas is a way that I define community, is infused with a grain sense of purpose. It says, a purpose that lies outside of its current eternal reality and constitution. It's the kind of community that happens to people in actual pursuit of a common vision of what could be. It involves movement, and it describes the experience of togetherness that only really happens among a group of people actually engaging in a mission outside itself. So as he talks about um, this person, he explains this communitas. Communitas is something that happens to a group of people. Sometimes we think about being in community. It's like, why are we, why are we in this relationship together? Why are, we, why are we related together? Why do we have this bond? And bonds happen through experience, right? Um, there was a, there's a church leader that talks about how they discipled one person. That was an active part of, of the gangs in their area, in a tough city, um, bad gangs. And when he became a disciple, he was excited to become a Christian. Because he was like, he thought that as I become a Christian, this church, this group, they're gonna be my new family. We're gonna have one another's back. Um, but then uh, the church leader realized that this guy stopped coming to church. <laughs> he stopped coming. And he said, yo, where have you been? He said, you know, I, thought, I think I misunderstood some things about the church. He said, because I thought as we came here that we were gonna have one another's backs. He said, I thought that we were gonna be like a family, like my gang was. Um, and the church we had to tell him, you know, he said, I'm, I'm so sorry. He said, you're right. Um, he said, we should have been a family in that kind of way. Um, he's talking about this communitas, how sometimes outside of the church, we have relationships like this, um, where we've grown close together um, from trial, from experience, basically. And as the church, we should be forming relationships in this kind of bond as we carry out a mission together. He says, this kind of relationship, it just happens. It just happens um, while we carry out a mission. And for us, as we live out as the church, um, we are engaged in a mission in being the church among the world around us. And that mission that we carry out is none other than the mission that God gave us, right? To go and to make disciples of the world. As we pursue this mission, communitas naturally happens. Because our lives as disciples, it's not an easy thing. As life happens itself, times get difficult, right? We have two friends that are in prison right now. Uh, my voice is sore today, I think because I'm slightly, I have like a cold, I think a little bit. So we've had a really busy summer. Michelle and Sarah were talking about, we've had a really good summer, but it's been busy. Um, so I think I have a little bit of cold, but what day was it? Friday morning, B and I, we went to go visit Jackson and Gashif at IDC. Um, 
and we, we spent time there to see what was going on, to see how we can help them. Um, and at IDC, um, maybe some of you have been there before to visit someone, but you have like a distance. You don't just talk on a phone to someone, you're just uh, behind two fences, far away. So you have to yell, you have to shout to each other. Um, and while there, B and I, our voices started to go just from shouting and uh, communicating. Um, but sometimes things happen, right? Friends end up in prison. We have a sister who lost her dad. Um, younger than me, right? Um, her father passed away. Difficult things happen, right? Just in life in general. But as a church, as we engage in the darkness of the world around us, man, there's going to be difficult things going on. And there's this experience, this breaking point that happens in our lives when we do that. Because when we give our lives up to him in that kind of way, transformation can happen. Um, there's this word, there's this word, and it's, it's not too important, but this word, um, limit, uh, liminal, liminity. Um, and that's this word of this breaking point. Um, when we're in a difficult situation, when we're at, we're at kind of a trial point, this threshold, um, when we undergo these difficult tasks, we experience these luminal experiences. And that's when transformation can happen. That's the, that's the point when bonds begin to form. As Jesus says, come and take up your cross and follow me. That's this discipleship that happens along this way. He says, you go therefore and make disciples of the world. You teach them to observe everything that I've taught you. Um, and what happens along the way is this discipleship. It's this road that we go on as we engage the dark world around us. Um, there's a movie that came out uh, maybe in the late the late 90s, I really like, it's called What Dreams May Come. Anyone ever seen this world with Robin Williams? It's kind of an old movie. Um, it's a really beautiful movie, but basically in the movie, um, it's really artistic kind of movie where a man's wife dies. Um, and it's, it's like, uh, like things don't make a whole lot of sense in the movie, but uh, the man's wife dies basically, okay? And uh, she was an artist and they had this really close bond and he finds out basically um, that she took her life, she killed herself um, because her children had died um, and she just never was able to overcome this thing. So the man uh, is played by Robin Williams, the husband. He decides that um, he, decides that he can't live um, without his wife. So he, he eventually, he dies as well. Um, he dies as well and he finds out his wife had committed suicide. She ends up in hell. And while he's in heaven, he learns of this. He says, I want to go down to hell and to bring her back. He says, I don't want my wife suffering, suffering condemned um, to hell. Um, so there ends up being this little group. There's these three men that end up forming these bonds um, as they go to the gates of hell to try and rescue his wife. It makes me think of Matthew 16, 18, as Jesus tells Peter, he says, I also say to you that you, Peter, and on this rock, his confession, he says, I'm going to build my church. And he says, the forces of Hades will not overpower it. Because as the church, our mission, in reality, we're battling against the gates of hell. Sometimes we forget this, right? <laughs> but it's a dark mission. Um, it's a battlefield that we sometimes don't like to think about. I think it's a beautiful picture. He says, I don't want to leave you there. He says, I'm going to leave where I am and come to rescue you. It's just like what Jesus did for us, right? Um, and as they're there, um, there's, there's one guy, this, this black gentleman here, he says, he tells Robin Williams' character, he says, there's no one that I'd rather be entering the gates of hell with than you. <laughs> and you see, think of going into hell, um, it's a scary, terrifying thing, right? There's a little mentor, he says, don't do it. Um, you're not going to come back, um, all these things. And, and theologically, you know, the movie, um, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense theologically at all. But they're there. They're on this rescue mission, right? So there's no one I'd rather be here with than you. And as I think about that line, I can't help but think of the church. Because that's us. That's what we do together as a family of believers. We're working together, uniting together to reach in to hell on the behalf of others. Turn me to the book of Jude real quick. Um, Jude, there's only one 
one chapter in Jude, but look here, Jude chapter 1, verse 3, he says, Dear friends, although I was eager to write to you about our common salvation, he says, I found it necessary to write and exhort you to contend for the faith that was delivered to the saints once and for all. Um, Jude has to write his book. This is Jude, Judas, by the way, one of Jesus' younger brothers. Um, but he says that I wanted to write to you about our common salvation. Jude's excited to write um, this letter, um, like several of the others. You know, he says, I want to write about this thing, but he says, but I thought it was necessary to write to you to contend for the faith that was delivered to you. That's that same faith that's been delivered to us through this gospel message. Now, flip, uh, flip back. So he writes about several things, about warning about people that they have to take a stand against. Um, now look here in verse 20. He says, but you, dear friends, he says, build yourselves up in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. He says, keep yourselves in the love of God, expecting the mercy of our Lord Jesus for eternal life. He says, pray always in the Spirit. Expect for that powerful life that Jesus promised you to take place. Expect for that mercy to come. And then he says this also in chapter 20 or verse 22. He says, have mercy on some who doubt. And he says, and save others by snatching them from the fire. On others have mercy and fear, hating even the garments defiled by their flesh. As he gives them this charge to take this stand against, against wicked men that have entered in into the church, he says, have mercy nonetheless. He says, remember your mission in snatching others from this fire. Um, so this communitas is, the, is what happens. It's the formation that happens as we as a church engage the forces of Hades around us. Um, and as we look at the book of Acts, um, we're going to look at a passage. We'll do, it, um, we'll do it in a couple weeks instead. But as you look at the book of Acts, it is the story of the church being, being formed in this very way. Um, if you look at Matthew, turn with me to Matthew chapter 9. Chapter nine. Matthew chapter 9 in verse, verse 36. Jesus says, when he, it says that when he saw the crowds, he felt compassion on them because they were weary and worn out like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Pray therefore to the Lord of harvest to send out workers in to his harvest, right? Um, Jesus, he spends this time praying for the future church. He begins praying for the leaders that he needs to spend time with, right? And he ends up choosing the 12. Um, look, look what it says in chapter 10. It says in verse 2, these are the names of the 12 apostles, right? First Simon called Peter, Andrew, his brother James, the son of Zebedee, John, his brother Philip, and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, uh, Thaddeus, Simon, Judas, that would later betray him. These are the 12. And he set them apart and he put them on a mission. Um, and something radical is going to happen as he sends them out. He knew that they're going to be entering dangerous territory. He says in verse 16, as he commissions them, he says, look, he says, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. I'm seeing you out like sheep among wolves. Um, what does that sound like to you? What if I, what if I said this? All right, Sarah. <laughs> Sarah, you ready? Mark, you ready? Here's your mission. Go and do it. And he says, oh yeah, by the way, as you go out, you're going to be kind of like a little lamb <laughs> in a field of wolves. You know, it's not the most comforting words right there, right? <laughs> it's like, what? So he says, therefore, as you go out, he says, be shrewd like vipers, Right? but innocent like doves. says, you can do this mission because you're not alone. I'm sending you out like this, but you're not alone because I'm with you. Um, but Jesus, Jesus, never, Jesus never prettied up, fluffied up our mission as disciples, right? He never made it sound like it was going to be all flowery beds of roses, right? He says, no, this is a tough mission I'm sending you on. He says, you need to use your head. You need to be quick like a snake, but keep a peaceful posture of a dove. And when we see that these 12 men, they end up forming this communitas 
as they carry this mission out. They do so while Jesus was alive in the Gospels, and then we see it happening now in the book of Acts. So turn me to Acts chapter 3, and we'll just look, we'll just look at a quick section of it since we're about out of time. So, so in summary, as I mentioned, in Acts chapter 2, the gospel message is proclaimed for the first time by the 12 apostles, right, in a miraculous way. Um, they're able to reach out to all kinds of nationalities through the working of the Holy Spirit, as each one understood it in their own language. And 3,000 people were added to them, right, is what we just saw. And then it says, in chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, now, Peter and John were going up to the temple complex at the hour of prayer, and there was a man who was lame from his mother's womb who came to that place, the temple gate called Beautiful. Um, and when he saw Peter and John, he looked up and turned to them and said, um, in verse, verse 3 it says, When he saw Peter and John about to enter the temple complex, he asked for help. And Peter, along with John, looked up to him intently and said, Look at us. So he turned to him and said, and Peter said, I have neither silver nor gold, but what I have, the name of Jesus Christ of Nazarene, get up and walk. And then it says, immediately he got up and stood among them. Now look here in verse 11. It says, um, while he was holding on to Peter and John, all the people were greatly amazed and ran toward them in what is called Solomon's Colonnade. Um, so Peter and John, they end up healing this man and all these people in this big popular area, Solomon's Colonnade, is kind of their communal gathering place. You think of something like a college courtyard or a big city park or the big city downtown square. This is the area that they're talking about. In verse 12 it says, when Peter saw this, he addressed the people. He said, men of Israel, why are you amazed? As, as they saw, they were shocked. They were amazed. He says, why are you amazed? Do you not know uh, that it is through the power, it was not through our power, our godliness, that he was made to walk? They say that this is through Jesus. Look in verse 16. It says, by faith in his name, who's his? This is Jesus. It says, by faith in his name, his name, this man was made strong, whom you see and know. So faith that comes through him has given him this perfect health in front of you all. They say it was faith in this man, Jesus. Um, so this group, they end up being arrested, Peter and John. They're beaten and arrested, and they're told, never speak in the name of Jesus again. But they don't listen, okay? They don't listen. Um, they go on, they go on, they go back to their family of community believers, and they ask to pray in boldness so that all the more can they spread the message of this Jesus that they've known. We see early on that the church, um, the church immediately, immediately enters into risk. Risk comes, dangers come, and they're told to stop carrying out their mission. Um, but we see that these believers, as they pray, the kingdom begins to spread. Look here in chapter four, verse, chapter four and verse three. It says, so they seized them and put them into custody until the next day, since it was already evening. In verse 4, but many of those who heard the message believe. And the number of men came to about how many? 5, to about 5,000, right? So as we think about Jesus, Jesus come, his mission was, I'm going to come and establish the kingdom, right? I spent time equipping these 12 men how to carry out my message of the kingdom. And they go to make these disciples. And as they go, their campaign isn't this savvy, um, this savvy message of, oh yeah, follow us, and life's going to all be perfect, right? Um, they knew there was going to be trials. They carried out the message, though, that this Jesus is going to come in your life. He's going to change everything. He's going to transform you into his likeness. I mean, you're not going to do it alone. You're going to do it together as a family. Um, but yet, there's obstacles, there's dangers around us, right? But God is going to be with us. God is going to be carrying you through. So that as the everyday battles of life come, as we lose friends, as we lose family, um, we lose jobs, says you have a support group, you have a network, you have your gang that's got your back. I mean, he says, as you do this, you're going to be transformed into the church. That's this community. You're going to be transformed 
and in the church. So you would think as people are being arrested, the people are like, whoa, <laughs> I don't know who these Jesus followers are, but I don't want to have anything to do with them, right? You would think so, maybe, but they're able to see the powerful hand at God among them, right? So in the midst of all this, how many were at it? 5,000, right? It's not because of fancy logos, a pretty building, but because they were seeing God at work among them. Um, just, uh, just this past week, Michelle and I um, in the church, we said goodbye, right, to the four ACU girls. Um, and I love seeing um, groups like this come over the summer because we see communitas happen among them. Um, before they all leave, I interview all of them and I talk about what, what did you learn the most during your time here and what do you not want to forget as you go away? And the, the things that the girls said this year was basically the same as what they said last year. And what it was, was basically this idea of communitas. Because just like the group of four last year, um, the four of them coming, most of them didn't know each other. Abby and Kinsey grew up knowing each other, but for the most part, they really didn't know each other, but they left calling each other sisters, right? So this is my sister. Um, just earlier today, we were messaging one another. They said, we miss you guys. Um, as they called Michelle and I their parents. <laughs> so you took care of us while we were there. And really we did grow close together during this time. But it wasn't because of just doing fun and games, it was because we pursued the mission of God together, right? Um, this is the kind of bond, the kind of family that's formed together as a church that should be formed as we leave these walls and strive to serve the community around us. As we open ourselves to God in this kind of way, he can't help but take hold of us as the church. Um, so we'll leave, we'll leave with this, this thought today. Turn with me. Um, to Ephesians chapter 2. Nung read from here um, earlier today, um, and I just want to finish out the section as Jesus, um, as Paul talks about how Jesus, he's destroyed the barrier walls that we have um, from the worldly standpoint, right? From the world, as it looks at us, it says, who is this group of Thai, Kiwis, Pakistanis, Africans, Americans, right? Um, who's this group? There's these dividing walls sometimes, right, of economic status, of jobs, of nationality. It says that Jesus, he destroys them, he unites us as one in the body. Um, he says this in verse, verse 17, he says, when Christ came, he proclaimed good news of peace to those who are far away and a peace to those who are near. He says, for through him, we both have access to the one spirit and to the father it's through the one spirit that he unites all of us together as a family so then you are no longer foreigners and strangers but fellow citizens he says with the saints and members of god's household he says now through christ jesus we're one family right in the spirit he says built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with christ jesus himself as a cornerstone. So as this whole building, this family, this church, says we're this, this organic family, this building is being fitted together in him, that is Jesus, and is growing into a holy sanctuary in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for God's dwelling in the spirit. So as we come together as a people of God, man, something beautiful happens. Uh, we form a special kind of building, he says, right? Not one made of brick or wood, but he says a spiritual building where God can come and dwell um, so that others in this world can come to know him. Um, I, hope that as we, I hope that as a church um, that we can replicate in this kind of way, that the world around us can see the caminita that we are. As they look from the outside in, they say, wow, those are people that have each other's back. Um, that's a group that I want to know. As they look and say, man, look at that fellowship that they have. Look at the friendship, the bond that they have. They said, I want that kind of community and that we can come and invite them to be a part of our church. Um, let's go to him in prayer. Father God, I pray that you, um, that you take hold of us, God. Father God, I pray that you humble us, um, that you correct us in ways um, that we've tried to take the steering wheel of your church at times, God. 
Um, Father, we pray um, that you show us how you, Lord, um, are a true head, how it's through your spirit and that we're united in you, that you destroy all the barriers um, that normally, um, by the worldly standpoint, divides us. Um, but we can be made one, united in you. God, I pray that you put difficult tasks ahead of us um, because we know it's as we carry out your mission as disciples um, that we become um, the family that we're called to be. Um, God, I pray that you give us eyes to see those um, that don't yet know you, um, that you give us eyes to see those that right now are on the other side of that wall, um, that gate of Hades, um, that need to be rescued, Father. I pray that you give us courage. I pray that you give us love. I pray that you give us the compassion that your son Jesus had, that we can dare to dive in to their worlds in the same way that you dived into our lives to save us as well. Um, God, we pray that you be with our brothers Gashif and Jackson in this time, um, that you give them courage and strength. Um, we pray that you take hold of just the situation um, so that they can be united with their families once again. Um, Father God, we pray in all things that we can live out our lives in courage and boldness and love and grace and peace as your son Jesus did. It's in his holy name we pray all these things. Amen.